and then I went ahead and did what I did. What did you do? The horribleness in which what I did to her. I dissected her body totally. Daniel Rakowitz is born on the 24th of December 1960 to parents Anthony and Velma. His mother stays at home to look after him and his two big brothers, while his dad is a criminal investigator for the US Army. So they move around a lot, but seem to have spent most time in Rockport, Texas. In 1963, the family were in Paris. Daniel and his mother are alone when they reach the hotel room. Once inside, Velma will take a massive heart attack in front of Daniel. He's only three years old and would claim over the years to remember that moment when he lost his mother. Three months after her death, his father remarries. He remarries his mother's youngest sister. He resents his father for this, obviously, and by the time he's five, he has delusions of grandeur, telling classmates he's Jesus because of his Christmas Eve birthday and that three wise men visit him most nights. He starts to perform miracles on the other kids. This seems to be the beginning of what would become a long-standing God complex. His father takes him to psychiatric hospitals where they will perform electric shock treatment and have him take Ritalin, a drug that is known for its calming qualities in children and is still used today. Alas, this had no real effect on Daniel. If anything, his behaviour got worse as the teenage years came along. By this time, his dad has left the US Army and is now a deputy sheriff in Texas. At 16, he is drinking heavily and smoking marijuana. So his dad has him arrested for possession in some vain hope of teaching his son a lesson, but to no avail. At 18, he joins the army, receiving an expert certification in marksmanship and is honorably discharged two years later. At age 22, he marries. He marries a 14-year-old local girl who remains anonymous. Rakowitz will tell her daily that he's decapitated a dog, took another's eye out with a screwdriver, and that he's strangled a sex worker to death with his bare hands. All the while, she will be beaten and chained up until one day in 1985, he will leave his wife and Texas for the bright lights of New York City, never to return. When he gets there, he heads to the East Village in Manhattan. There, he finds Tompkins Square Park, a park full of nomads and people who just seem to have found themselves on the wrong side of the tracks. Rakowitz, however, sees a new audience for his God complex. You see, he wants to start a new religion, the Church of 966. Here is a quote he used to say to potential followers. I was born on Christmas Eve, 122460, which equals 96. I have 18 letters to my name. I was born at 9.02 p.m. in the 21st hour, which they say signifies the coming of the Lord Jesus. Most were good people in the park, some were not. He settles down and gets to know everyone, all the while telling them he is Jesus, his birthday is Christmas Eve, he can perform miracles, his usual attention-seeking antics, only now he has a rooster. He's named Rooster, that he will carry on his shoulder for some sort of effect. He's a dishwasher for a time, but never turns up, so does get the sack. He sells marijuana on the side and likes to call himself the Marijuana Guru. The people in the park didn't mind Rakowitz. 
He was strange, yeah. And to be fair, they all called him the weirdo, which is pretty bold considering the crowd he's in. But because he would sometimes cook up some food for the park residents, plus he sold marijuana, they didn't mind accepting some of his bullshit. One person he befriended through dealing was Sylvie. She had an apartment overlooking the square. They hadn't kicked her and her boyfriend Sean out as they had a lease and paid the rent. She had seen Rakowitz struggle and seen him feed most of the people outside. It wouldn't be a bad thing having a marijuana dealer on hand. So she invited him to move in if he agreed to split the 500 a month rent, which he does. Over the moon at having a bed, running water, a shower, a huge TV that Rakowitz will become pretty transfixed with, and a kitchen he can cook whenever he wants. By 1988, the East Village was a place that was in the process of being cleaned up. Poor people out and rich people in. The park became the HQ for the former residents, including their anger, resentment and the protests that followed. Understandably, I mean, where were they to go? You know, I see y'all talking about, you know, your own personal stuff, but what about somebody crazy like me that would come behind you that just totally hates cops? It was just like nothing more than just take off all your heads while you was looking the other direction. Well, you park denizen Daniel Rockwich admits his plan was to distract the cops. This is also the year Sylvie and Sean break up. They both move out, leaving the apartment for Rakowitz to keep going and find a lodger. This lodger will come in the form of Monica Billy, a 26-year-old dancer from Sweden who had come to New York to chase her dreams, studying at the lucrative Martha Graham's School of Dance and working at Billy's topless bar in downtown Chelsea and has some modelling jobs on the side. We don't know how they really met, as Rakowitz is a compulsive liar, but we can imagine that maybe he offered her a joint or the rooster caught her attention. Who knows? What we do know is she moves in and agrees to split the $500 rent. At some stage, they become sexual, but Monica is never serious about it. Rakowitz, however, has become infatuated with Monica, making it clear she doesn't feel the same Monica starts to date and sometimes will bring a love interest home, which infuriates Rakowitz. By August of 1989, the lease is up for the flat. Rakowitz can't sign for it because he's not working, but Monica is, so she signs, allowing them both to stay. But this is just a ruse by Monica. She knows if she signs the lease, she can kick Rakowitz out, which is exactly what she does. Rakowitz goes ballistic, screaming, how dare you? This is my flat. He takes off and heads to Sylvie's new place, telling her the story, then proclaiming he will kill her. Done. Deal. Sylvie calms him down, knowing he primarily talks a lot of shit. She doesn't think for a second he means it. But a few days later, he'll go back to Sylvie's. This time, the statement is, I'm going to kill her tomorrow. Will you help me get rid of the body? Now, this is where Sylvie becomes a bit sketchy to me. There's been a few days relapse for him to calm down, but instead, he's here saying it again, only this time with a deadline. In Sylvie's defence, he is a first-class bullshitter, so there's that. Trying not to anger him anymore, she just goes with it and says, OK, sure, I'll help. Not thinking for a second, allegedly, 
he'd go through with it. On the 19th of August, 1989, Sylvie takes a walk round to the flat in Tompkins Square. No one answers, so she uses her old key to let herself in. The flat is warm, and she can see and smell food cooking, so walks over to the big pot on the stove, just to have a wee nosy. She was greeted with Monica's partly burnt and boiled head, face up, eyes closed. Trembling with fear, Sylvie walks to the bathroom where she finds Monica's ribcage. There's no limbs, no flesh, no tissue, and there's blood everywhere. She runs petrified from the flat. Now, instead of calling the police or for any kind of assistance, she calls Rakowitz. He's surprised she's been to the flat and goes as far as to say, I'm sorry you had to see that. He then explains that he strangled her with an electrical cord, jumped on her head 10 times, and then stabbed her 30 times before dismembering her body. Here comes Bright Spark Sylvie with this concerned statement to Rakowitz, and I quote, You better clean the flat good before it's discovered, and when you're done, let me know and I'll come back round to visit. He finishes the dismemberment using the toilet as the main disposal point. Anything he couldn't flush, for example, her skull, her bones, he threw in a bucket and filled it with cat litter. He takes it to a storage unit and leaves it there, locking up behind himself. Rocket scientist Sylvie never tells a soul. Feeling godlike powerful, never one to give up a chance to brag, he starts telling everyone all the gory details of Monica's demise at his hands sharing with them the fact that he had made soup with her brain, stew with the rest of her, and gave it out to the homeless outside. Witnesses at the time said, yeah, he did come out with soup for us all. Some people were physically sick when they heard, and coupled with the fact no one had seen Monica for a few weeks now, made it all the more real. By September of 89, approximately one month after Monica's disappearance, police get wind of the story and decide to investigate just a little to see if there's any truth to it. It doesn't take long before they hear Rakowitz's name, along with words like the weirdo, god guy, guy with the rooster. He's taken in for questioning. He immediately confesses to the whole thing telling detectives everything. And then I went ahead and did what I did. What did you do? The horribleness in which what I did to her. I dissected her body totally. I just started chopping her up, cooking her meat. Chop her up? Uh, with a butcher knife and the aid of a saw. What kind of saw did you use? Just a wood saw. Where did you get the saw? From a hardware store. So you went out and bought a saw? That day, I went out and bought a saw. What did you do first? When you decided that's what you were going to do? Smoked a lot more pot. Smoked up like a quarter ounce of pot. What did you cut her head off? Uh, right away was like the first thing that went. And the hands and the feet were next, which I boiled them up right away. Bust her piece by piece down the toilet. And before, you said something about putting in a pot of water? Yeah, they had and they all Why did you do that? all over to cook her up so I could manage the meat better. His apartment is ransacked, including the plumbing, but they found nothing. Remember, it's the 80s. They don't have the technology we have today. So they ask Rakowitz, where's Monica's remains? He tells them about the lockup and that he kept all the bones together so he could one day give her back to her parents. And there was us thinking, this guy is a cold-blooded monster. But before we hang our heads in shame, two long years later, in February of 1991, 
Rakowitz goes on trial because, believe it or not, he pleads not guilty. He defends himself by saying this is a complete setup. He's been framed. In court, he will jabber on about all sorts of nonsense, not making one bit of sense. His lawyers will use the defence that he is not of sound mind and must be assessed by specialists, which he is many times, and all will find him to indeed be insane. After nine days of deliberation, on the 22nd of February 1991, the jury find Daniel Rakowitz innocent of intentional murder and acquitted by reason of insanity, on account of murder by depraved indifference, and the charge of tampering with evidence was thrown out. His response to the jury was this. I won't fault you for your verdict. The prosecution had an overwhelming case against me, and I hope someday we can smoke a joint together. Jurors would later say that most of them wanted a guilty verdict, but two jurors disagreed. Because Rakowitz always harped on about being God, police were convinced he was part of a satanic cult and that he must have had accomplices. Two years later, they even arrest two men, Randy Easterday and Patrick Jeffries. However, the case was thrown out as there was absolutely no evidence. Well, that, that dude in New York that I used to know in the 80s, he was never my friend, but he was just like this crazy wingnut guy that got written out because he, he had this he had this girlfriend that was a, she was a mo- she was a European model in all these fashion magazines. And then she 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 dis she disappeared in like 88. And uh and I, I knew I was already living in New York. I was like, I was like, he killed her. I know he fucking killed her. Cause I, I mean he did, of course he did. But at the time, like he had like they hadn't found the body or anything yet. And I used to see him at the soup kitchen all the time. And and, and her name was Monica. And, and people were asking, like, hey, what would happen to Monica, you know? And and, uh, and people were like, I haven't seen her for like a week, two weeks, whatever. And I remember talking to friends in New York. I'm like, fucking damn, I killed her, man. Like, you know how fucking crazy that dude is, man. Like, because he lived in this one squat. And he used to kill all these chickens. And he would kill, like, he would kill cats and dogs and, like, like, like fucking put pentagrams in their blood all over his room. And he's like this big dude. He's like big fucking scary guy. He was like, he was like probably like in his late twenties. And I, like I was like 18, 19. All my friends were around the same age. So he was like 10 years older and like way bigger and way stronger than us. So we were all pretty scared of this guy. And I didn't want anything to do with him. And then, uh, yeah, and then his fucking girlfriend disappeared. And then uh, it turned out that he, he fucking killed her. He chopped her head off put her head in a locker at Grand Central Station at the train station and then he, he fucking cooked up her he cooked up her body in a big vat and he served it to people in the park. I never ate it because I never fucking I wouldn't eat anything that like if that guy ever offered me shit, like I would never take anything. So you can like but is he, there uh, I could Google this and Oh like yeah this. totally yeah it's totally true. What he's, was his he's, name? He's in a he's in an institution for the criminally insane in upstate New York. But the re- the reason I brought it up was because that guy like he gets like tons of fucking marriage proposals like to this day. And his name his name is Dan- Daniel Rakowitz. I think Rakowitz is just like R A K O W I T Z like that. But yeah, he he got he didn't get sentenced to prison. He got sentenced to the state state asylum. He's been in there like thirty something years. But yeah, he gets like tons of fucking marriage proposals. Yeah, you could read that. That happened in like 88, 89 in New York. And he so you were saying the same squad for a little while yeah but that's not where he killed her he killed her in this this other apartment like she they didn't say anything like you maybe don't kill animals in no pe- people were scared of him and he 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 was like he's a drug dealer too so he he always like like he would give a lot of like the younger like a lot of the younger kids like he would just give them drugs and give them samples and shit like here try this man and so people were like people like were always like oh yeah daniel he's crazy but like he's cool he gave me drugs or whatever so people just kind of it was just kind of like the apathy. Like I don't think people liked that he killed animals, but they were like, they, like I was fucking terrified of him. You know, I wasn't gonna. I was like 18. I wasn't gonna fucking confront the dude. Man, I was like, this guy's crazy. A lot of people in the park ate that man. Like so many people <laughs> in the park ate it. In 2005, 
Rakowitz petitions to be released under the grounds he is no longer a danger to society. Yeah, he's still in. <laughs>